So welcome to the Black Imagination and the Beyond panel. We're so excited to highlight and welcome these incredible scholars, activists, and change makers. When we first thought of the theme for this panel, we really wanted to emphasize the work that folks, particularly black women who have historically done imaginative and transformative work are doing that imagines healing and practices beyond the systems of oppression that we are so often subjected to and told can't be transformed. All of our panelists exemplify the work of going beyond within their own realms, whether that be within education and academia, data and technology, and or nonprofit work in ways that we believe are both spiritual and justice oriented. Please help me to welcome Sakuria Dickerson, Asia Upchurch, Yeshi Milner, and our student moderator, Azmira Hamari Davis. All right, so to quickly introduce our panelist and moderator, uh, we'll start um, with Sakuria. Sakuria Dickerson has been to over 30 countries studying, working, and praying with her feet. She is the current interim director of Prophetic Resistance Boston, a non denominational, nonpartisan, faith based nonprofit that uses the development of leadership skills to empower citizens to organize their communities and find solutions to the problems they face. She also serves as the program director of World, of World Voices in Brockton, Mass., where she teaches leadership skills to an after school youth choir. Thank you for being here, Sakuria. Okay. Next up, we have Asia Upchurch, the dancing diplomat. She's a seed planter and soil agitator who creates, facilitates, and designs for radical change. This translates to her working as a sought-after performer, instructor, and education consultant whose work sits at the nexus of youth advocacy, social justice, and transformative education. She's also a lecturer at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Thank you for being here, Aisha. Next up, we have Yeshi Milner, who is the founder and executive director of Data for Black Lives. She has worked since she was 17 behind the scenes as a movement builder, technologist, and data scientist on a number of campaigns. She started Data for Black Lives because for too long she straddled the worlds of data and organizing and was determined to break down the silos to harness the power of data to make change in the lives of black people. Most recently, she was named one of Forbes 30 Under 30. Thank you for being here, Yashi. And then we have Asmira Hamari Davis, a poet, writer, and capitalist Capoeirista. She fosters critical pedagogy through hip hop and capoeira. As a Fulbright performing arts alumna, her creative projects promote cultural identity and English literacy through arts and education. Rooted in the pursuit of racial justice and healing, she interweaves the African and Palestinian diasporas. She is currently a second year Masters of Theological Studies student here at Harvard Divinity School. Please give a warm, work a warm welcome to Azmira and the rest of our panel. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Nicole, so much for the introductions. And thank you to our panelists for being here. Thank you for all of you who have joined us for this convening. Um, it is an honor and a pleasure and a privilege to, um, to be joined by each of you and the work that you're doing. Um, and I really want to first just allow you all to speak about um, what, dri what drives you, what motivates you, and, and what um, centers you as a, a black woman doing work that engages radical imagination beyond just the classroom or beyond um, you know, four corners of an institution. Um, so I'd love to open it up. If whoever feels so called to, to speak first can go ahead and share. And what we'll do is ask questions afterwards and open it up to the audience, if that sounds all right. Does anyone feel compelled to, to speak first? <laughs> Should I do here or do you? Um, I think you can go ahead. And, yeah, you can speak from. Okay. From, from here if it's comfortable. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much for having me and for, for being here and for convening this amazing space. Nicole, thank you for inviting me and Ashley um, for organizing this. I met Nicole last year. Um, she was an amazing conference planning fellow at our second Data for Black Lives conference um, and really helped us take it from a convening the first year that was 350 people to over 650 people. 
So <laughs> when she said she was doing a conference, I said, oh, I'm going to be there. <laughs> you know, when I first heard the title Black Imagination and, and the Beyond, it, it really resonated with me. So much of the work that I do is about imagining beyond the reality that we have now, the reality that's often Im imposed on us. And I thought about the words that I actually used to open up our second conference, which was, everything begins with imagination. Every system, every p political force, every place. What we believe with our minds, we create with our bodies. And for me, you know, that's really, really what has uh, grounded um, my work, grounded Data for Black Lives, and I'll talk more about Data for Black Lives as well. We're a movement of over 4,000 scientists and activists committed to harnessing the power of data to make concrete and measurable change in the lives of black people. I started Data for Black Lives because for far too long, um, data has been weaponized against black communities. Um, but in my experiences as, as an organizer, as an activist, I really was able to see the ways in which data could be used as a tool for social change, not just a weapon of political oppression. And I launched Data for Black Lives, as I said, with the conference in November of 2017 at the MIT Media Lab. Um, but my work with Data for Black Lives really started way before that. The very first time I ever collected data was actually as a high school student growing up in Miami, Florida. Um, and this was after some other young people um, had actually organized a peaceful protest in response to uh, their vice principal putting a student in a chokehold, right? Yeah, and, and you know, this was 2007, 2008. So before, you know, thankfully, we had more mainstream attention around police brutality happening in the streets and state violence in the schools. Um, and we, we had video camera footage, but it was like still grainy. It was like Nokia phones. Um, <laughs> you know, but it was amazing how these young people organized. And unfortunately, instead of being seen as change makers and as courageous leaders using nonviolent tactics, the school district, the police force, the, the, the the, the city sentenced SWAT teams, police cars. And usually when I do this talk, I actually show video clips because I remember being at home, watching CNN and seeing on the TV students riot at Miami Edison Senior High School. And I knew it wasn't a riot. I knew the kids who were on TV being slammed against police cars, pushed up, hidden with batons. I went to elementary school with them, right? They were regular kids wanting to fight back um, to change their schools, to change their realities, right? their material conditions. And I think that for me switched something in me. Um, I got involved with a youth organization called Power Youth Center for Social Change in Miami, a very small organization. And we hit the ground running, right? We, you know, I realized that unless we found other channels of expressing our political voice beyond protest, and, and, and in addition to protest, our lives would continue to be under assault. Uh, so we collected 600 surveys asking young people about their experiences with suspensions in schools, with arrests in schools. And it was really amazing because for the first time, you know, while we were doing these surveys, young people were like, wow, no one's ever asked me about, you know, being suspended. And I didn't know that, you know, because I was, you know, getting pushed out of school for not having an ID or having the wrong color T-shirt, because back then that was like gang affiliation, um, that, you know, I'm not a bad kid. This is a citywide problem. It's a statewide problem. And it's known as the school to prison pipeline. And there's groups of people, not just here in Miami, but all over the country who are fighting for solutions. One of them being restorative justice, which is what we were fighting for. You know, and it took us a while for us to actually get restorative justice implemented in schools in Miami. But it's amazing that we took those, uh, those surveys, took all those findings, and we made it into a comic book. And even today, I hear from people in different cities, Oakland, you know, Knoxville, all over you know, Chicago, who are facing different conditions, um, but in different places. They were able to use our comic book, right? And to you know, uplift, the, you know, to, to not only reflect this missing data about young black people's experiences in schools, but to really also push back against this narrative that was about us. So that's what really pushed me into thinking about data, reclaiming data as, a, as protest, data as accountability, and data as collective action. Um, I went to college, and my um, focus in college was to just get as much 
data collection research skills as possible. Um, I went to Brown, so you know we had open curriculum there, so they allowed that. <laughs> you could really, I mean, if, if you're very driven and you have a, a, a vision, you could do that there. So thank God for that. But, you know, my goal was to go back to Miami and bring those skills. And I had an opportunity in 2012 when I graduated and in addition to continuing the fight uh, for restorative justice, I was invited to work on a campaign um, this time about something that, you know, I didn't know much about, which was black infant mortality, right? I was 22. I was a self-proclaimed feminist. I didn't know about breastfeeding. I didn't know much about women's and maternal health. And I definitely didn't know the ways in which corporate forces, such as infant formula companies and hospitals, were really, really contributing to this disparity that even though the infant mortality rate um, had decreased nationwide across the board. This, the fact that black babies were three times more likely to, to die before their first birthday had persisted. And, you know, moms in the community knew what was going on, even though researchers overwhelmingly said, oh, you know, we're not, we don't know why this is happening. We don't, you know, maybe it's just racism, right? No further kind of interrogation behind that. So, you know, moms in the community knew that, you know, again, overuse of procedures like C-sections, uh, aggressive marketing of infant formula, and just an overall environment that wasn't about life, it was about death, it was about destruction, it was about money, um, was what, what was contributing to the, infant mor the black infant mortality rate. So, you know, I came onto this campaign at the very end. Um, my job was to collect these surveys so that we didn't have to give the money back to the funder that was paying for <laughs> the campaign and, and therefore, like, actually, our, or you guys know what I'm talking about, our, our organization. And, you know, because I had the skills, I was able to work with a small team of moms. I wasn't a mom myself, but these, these young women were my age um, and were dealing with this firsthand. One woman, Rachel, she actually passed away during the campaign from complications. So when I talk about urgency and I talk about what, what we were dealing with and material conditions and the need to assert life, this was very real for me then and, and as it is now, right? So we surveyed 300 moms about their experiences in the hospitals. And I wrote a report called A Call for Birth Justice in Miami. And again, after years, you know, even before I came on the campaign, after years of trying to get even on the radar of the hospital, um, the hospital called us the CEO, director of obstetrics, and they were like, wow, you guys collected this data yourself. This is amazing. We're actually going to totally revamp these policies, and we're going to you know, change the whole maternal and, and child health ward, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, for me, that was a, a, an accomplishment. But the biggest thing was them saying, you know what, and, and from now on, anytime we think about policy change at this hospital, which in, which in Miami, our public hospital is the largest public hospital in the country, anytime we think of these changes, we're going to go to the community first, right? So that, for me, those two experiences was what really helped me say, wow, OK, this is the power of data in the hands of people who need it the most, right? This is what, they, this is what, what we can do with strong leadership, grassroots organizing, black women's leadership, really, too. At the center, this is what we can do. And you know, I ended up moving to New York City, where I worked at colorofchange.org, um, helping to, yes, great. We have some Color of Change members of the house. Yes, so my job was to you know, kind of do what I was doing in, in Miami, but at a different level, to launch the first um, online petition platform for black communities organized for.org. So I was able to take, you know, these amazing skills at Color of Change, this whole playbook that, that they built up of digital tactics and strategies and put it in the hands of people who are working on things. So many different amazing campaigns all over the country from San Francisco to Raleigh, North Carolina. But even then, I was like, okay, wow. My relationship to data is that it's liberatory, right? Is that it's powerful, is that it can move the needle on policies, is that it can shift narratives and really change the public imagination, right? But the reality was that, again, data has been weaponized against black communities, whether it's FICO credit scores, <laughs> right? Predictive policing algorithms, risk assessments, facial recognition. You know, we were at a time, especially in 2016, when I started Data for Black Lives, where all these things, all these innovations started to arise while policy wasn't changing. In fact, it was regressing, right? We, that was the national narrative. So, you know, I was in this place and I said, okay, wow. What would it look like to bring together scientists and activists? What would it look like to break down the silos um, between these two communities and to bring together people who have been thinking about data for social good and, and specifically people who are thinking about it for black communities? And 
that's where we said, okay, I don't know, you know, how to start data for black lives. I don't really know what this is, is going to look like. I have this vision. I have this instinct and this urge that this is something that needs to happen. Let me have a conference. Let's, let's see who comes. So we hosted the first conference at the MIT Media Lab, and it sold out, you know, when, once we released the, the, the tickets, it sold out within a week. And then the conference was huge. It was massive, and it was life-changing for people, right? Scientists who were like, black scientists who were like, you know, I've never had a space where I felt like I, I belonged, right? Where my ideas and, and my identity was, uh, was being affirmed even more than like this like, you know, false idea of like objectivity, right? Activists who, with a little bit of data capacity and, and with a little bit of, you know, support and, and resources, you know, could, could do a whole lot more. So that was our first Data for Black Lives conference. Two sold out conferences later, a network of over 4,000 scientists and activists, right? The ability and the, you know, blessing of being able to raise a lot of money in the process. We're at a whole new phase with, with Data for Black Lives, right? This year, we're launching regional and national hubs all over the country. I'm currently kind of on a speaking and writing tour for a book that I'm writing called Abolish Big Data, right? And I'm very explicit about the word abolition. People say, oh, abolition, you know, just destroy everything. Abolition means to create something new, right? The, the prison abolition movement asks the question, how do we respond to the world's problems, the most pressing social problems without recourse to prisons? I, my lens is, you know, how do we also use that lens and how do we apply it to big data? How do we dismantle the structures that put the power of data into the hands of a few, right? The Facebooks, the Googles, the, you know, MIT Jeffrey Epstein kind of situations, right? And how do we change that and put it into the people's hands who could really, really use it for what I believe is good and is the right reasons? And that's really, you know, very briefly, some of the things that we're working on. Hopefully, I have more time to kind of expand on, on what else. But, you know, I think I'll leave you with this, that, you know, in our work, we talk a lot about algorithms. An algorithm, by definition, is a is very simple, a set of step-by-step -step instructions to solve a problem. A recipe is an algorithm. And I think the most important thing when we're thinking about machine learning that people don't often realize is that even beyond the code, you have to ask the question, what are you optimizing, right? When you're making a recipe, you know, what are you optimizing for? You know, do you want something that's healthy, uh, where you don't care about taste, or you, don't, you, you want something that's really, really delicious that you don't care if it's healthy or not? That informs the, the, the ingredients that you're going to put into it. And that's a question that I ask myself every day. What am I optimizing? What am I optimizing in this world? A world where we're reinforcing um, the same archaic racist narratives only through the guise of technology, where just because a technology is new doesn't mean it's innovative or beneficial? Or are we optimizing a world of, where justice, fairness, solidarity, equity um, is at the root and is the priority? So anyway, I'll end there. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you so much um, for that uh, powerful just oversight and overview of what uh, the what and the why behind the work that you're doing. Um, and um, I think we, I'd like to just kind of go ahead and allow for a continued um, conversation. So if, if whoever wants to go next, you can, and then we'll kind of jot down the questions here and, and ask them afterwards. Good afternoon, everyone. So again, my name is Sakaria Dickerson. I am a community organizer, um, the director of Prophetic Resistance Boston, um, a healer, a mom, a wife, um, and a soul who's very excited to just be up here and sharing some space with some very, very incredible women doing amazing things. So I'm glad this wasn't too much work for one slide, because that's all it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth it, right? Yeah. It's worth it. Naira Wai creates magic with her tapestry of emotions configured in these very simple words. I love myself. The quietest, simplest, most powerful revolution ever. We have a community organizing principle that professes that the first revolution is always internal. 
as an organizer, I've worked on so many campaigns dealing with mass incarceration issues, school to prison pipeline, um, you name it. And one of the things that I'm clearest about is the most oppressive system that we're fighting again against are the mental prisons that so many social justice workers live within. If we're not, hey baby. <laughs> If we're not careful, our movements implode in rage or taper off as a result of burnout. We conduct endless needs assessments for how to do more strategic planning so that we can move the ball forward in our social justice movements without prioritizing the needs of the social justice worker. I use storytelling as a contemplative practice to break oppressive systems. What can be more disruptive to racism patriarchy, the prison industrial complex, the nonprofit industrial complex. Y'all know that's a thing? Yeah. To our piss poor handling of immigration reform or lack thereof, then one person taking an opportunity to just pause and love themselves, to care for themselves. Every meditation, an opportunity to be proactive instead of reactive. Every thought, thought thoughtfully, an opportunity to protest burnout and to create investment in being able to endure the ups and downs of this very hard work. Mental Health First Aid reports that nearly half of adults in their lifetime are gonna experience some form of mental illness. The World Health Organization reports that depression is the leading cause of disability worldwide. But y'all don't need these facts to know what's going on. One of the things I'm clear about is those are the statistics that are reported. But anybody like me, and you grew up in black culture, black brown culture, where what goes on in your house stays in your house? Anybody like me, where you grew up in a household hearing, oh, I'm too blessed to be stressed? <laughs> Creating this, well, what's wrong with you if you can't help yourself? if you can't figure out um, how to, how to do um, the things for yourselves that we're assuming are supposed to come from an outside source. <clears throat> I think the thing that troubles me the most though is this really challenging revelation that I've been having over the past two years of doing this work, that we live in so many communities where we have a culture that shuns certain mental health illnesses while praising others. I don't know if it's just me, but stress, depression, anxiety, these things are mental health illnesses, but all too often they get couched as overproductivity, as an asset for a company, as an asset for our social justice work. All too often they get couched into, oh, but that person's just able to multitask because they can deal with so many things at the same time when their baby just died. Through storytelling and holding space for folks to talk about the wholeness of who they are, the good, the bad, the messy, I think that's where the real healing work is. I think that's all our social justice work is about. There's this beautiful book called A Course in Miracles. Anybody read A Course in Miracles? Oh, yeah, I love A Course in Miracles. It says that there's only one miracle, and it's not walking on water. It's not restoring sight to the blind. The only miracle we have is looking at another soul and reminding them, ain't nothing wrong with you. Everything you need, you already got. You're already whole. So let me be clear, I'm not a therapist. I definitely don't pretend to be one. And I don't have to be, because there are many folks out there like Dr. Brene Brown who are doing some amazing work around <laughs> just shedding light on when we're willing to be seen, that there's so much healing in that, so much work productivity that comes with just that. So I'm encouraging people to explore different traditional, non-traditional healing moda modalities that are effective to you, um, re resonate with you, are authentic to you. But what I bear witness to are the thousands of testimonies that I've been honored to hear over my course of doing this work that scream to the healing power of storytelling and its critical ability to be one of the most foundational igniters of movements. Of them all, the most insightful experience that I've had that's personally pushed me to seek change and justice has been my own mental um, health struggles with depression. From the time I was in fifth grade, I struggled with depression. 
going to magnet schools, um, indoctrinated into this Western work hard culture, um, promising opportunities of stuff that I don't have. I learned to excel in high stress situations. Anybody else mm -hmm. <laughs> learn to do that? I learned to wear overproductivity as a status symbol and that I would be rewarded for doing so in as much as I was willing to put myself in competition with someone else. I learned to compete for scholarships. I learned to compete for jobs. Learned to compete for promotions. Learned to com compete for funding from other nonprofits. Learned to compete for um, social movement. Learned to compete with other social movements to um, have access to leaders and community. Learned to compete for news coverage. Along the way, learned to compete for so many other things. Compete, perform, compete, then repeat it all over again. So I appreciate that we're talking about dismantling the status quo with alternative activism practices. I don't think it gets more status quo than our participation in upholding these oppressive systems of competition than through the glorification of high stress power positions that we're all working towards. And even worse, the ways in which we normalize stress as just a part of our everyday life. I learned early on that mastering the telling of my story as a form of Excuse me, I learned earlier that mastering the telling of my story was actually a form of currency that you could use if you didn't have money. Mm -hmm. I learned that if I could tell my story in a certain way, funders would fund the movements that I care about. I learned to develop storytelling as a tool that serves me for those purposes and can serve my community. But I also incurred a lot of injury in the process of only telling certain stories. Like Nicole mentioned, before I turned 30, I'd already traveled to almost 30 countries. I was doing all this work, State Department sending me places. I'm like, I am on top of the world. I'm for real living my bucket list. Mm -hmm. And why in the world am I having some suicidal thoughts? Mm -hmm. All of these incredible experiences, starting with, hi, my name is Sakuria. And in 500 words or less, I'm going to tell you why I deserve this opportunity over someone else. Mm -hmm. I got really clear that the stories that I thought I was leaving behind in Nashville, Tennessee, my hometown, where I'm from, Nashville folk. Yeah, Nashville folks. <laughs> yeah, we, 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 we in this place. <laughs> I got really clear that those stories were going to follow me all over the world, mm -hmm. that those stories are right here standing right here today. The stories I learned, learned not to tell are the ones of growing up in an alcoholic home, the trauma of adult acne. And look, let me tell you, ain't nothing worse than when you escape the drama of um, acne during puberty, only to get it after you graduate from college because you're stressed <laughs> out and everything else. Ain't nothing worse than that. I, I could spend a whole nother 15 minutes just talking about that, but I got to move on. <laughs> Okay, look, hey, see this too. I tell you, I, I got to move on. We got to move on, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Thank you. I'm having fun with you guys. <laughs> Ain't nothing worse than the trauma of doing what I've been told I'm supposed to do, working hard, getting scholarships, getting internships, all this access, and then graduating with debt and not being able to find a job that was going to pay me a living wage. I struggle telling the stories of the scars um, that I experienced growing up with parents divorcing, not having stable home, the insecurities, and sometimes even now, I still feel as a wife and how I'm balancing this work and being a good wife, a good mom. I struggle with the shame of what it means for me to be a minister in my own right. I struggle with depression. Fighting for justice and change for everyone else, everywhere else, and not experiencing it for myself. What I've gotten clear about is as I've started to share my own desperation for help, this different Me Too movement has started to manifest in my own consciousness um, and in the circles of influence that I have. As I've become willing to stop performing Sakuria 
I was affirmed as black and brown lawyers and journalists and department heads at universities and faith leaders and my people from around the way started saying, me too. Same struggles, me too. I'm in need of healing too. The liberation we've been relentlessly fighting for, for other people, finally getting clear enough to know we actually have access to it too, but it's through the sharing of our stories, the non-sexy stories. The truth is, some of our messy stories, and I want to be very, very clear about this because I'm not encouraging everybody to just go out, tell your story to, to, to whoever. Because the truth of the matter is, some of our messy stories um, get us New York best-selling books, right? And some of our messy stories have the Boston police showing up at our door talking about, hey, put you over a lot of five, right? This is true. So I'm asking you, use discernment around the sharing of your story, use discernment around the when and the where of your story, but to be very, very clear that a lot of the trauma that can sit in our body that immobilizes us from being able to do social justice work lies in those stories getting stuck in places and not being reevaluated. Mm -hmm. A few years ago, um, I was blessed to have this session where I did an energy dousing. I'm sure if people were familiar with that. So this man is running these rods up and down my body, and he gets to my throat. And he's like, you have really low vibration in your throat. But it would shock me to think that you have a hard time using your voice, because normally that's what that means. And I knew exactly what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. Because I had just spoken to my friend who identifies as a shaman um, in the West African tradition. And she, told me, she was telling me about how there, there's a school of thought that women in West Africa um, give advice to African-American women around, look, one of the things that's causing us to be so sick is our inability to be able to use our voices in ways that move energy out of our body. Mm -hmm. That so many of us are accustomed to using our voices in sophisticated, polished ways. And definitely not screaming, stuff like that. Stuff like that immediately puts us in a place of being dismissed, puts us in a place of being able to um, just completely um, not be heard, and even worse, can sometimes put us in places where people think that they then have right and free range to harm us. So I got really, really clear that the most healing thing that I was going to be able to do was this. The most healing thing that I did all last year. The most healing thing that I've done all last year. But think for yourself, when's the last time that you have just interrupted space and just screamed? When's the last time that you stopped your executive board meeting and just screamed? <laughs> When's the last time? When's the last time you've been walking around at midterms, finals? <laughs> and, ah! <laughs> so we're laughing, but the truth is, you probably can't think of the last time you did it because we don't do it. And it's on purpose. We learn to use our voices in ways that benefit other folks yeah. and ways that facilitate our healing. We hear all these narratives from outside of us about how those are not worthy, not valuable, not appropriate means of communication. There's this therapeutic practice called co-counseling and the whole premise of it is that by pure virtue of you being able to just, just discharge, just to get your emotions out there, so whether through crying, screaming, like whatever it is, just by getting those feelings out, that you don't need advice from anyone else. You don't need to be told what to do. By pure virtue of you discharging, you heal yourself enough to be clear enough to make any decision that you need to make. Because every decision that you need to make, you already know what to do. That this constant look and source of um, information somewhere else, that we don't need it, that we already know. So I want to end with this. I think through the process of 
the storytelling and like really mastering the art of discharge. We aren't just creating revolutions. In essence, we become one. We start the process of just becoming one. In our competitive culture where uplifting stories are commodified and our less desirable ones are used to shame us, I work on dismantling judgments around, the, around which stories are worth sharing and which ones we need to suffer with in silence. It's been a priority for me to cultivate in my social justice work alternative self-care practices like the use of discharge in my listening circles, one-to-ones, and training spaces to draw out stories that get buried in our chemical and emotional responses and stored in unhealthy behaviors that make us sick. I lead some people through um, shamanic drumming meditations and strategic planning sessions when they're getting ready to make hard decisions. So instead of just looking at projections about what we should do, asking people to really be reflective and go inward. I'm an herbal student. I lead healing retreats for black and brown women where there's no presenter when you show up. Everybody's responsible for the teacher learner um, capacity and the belief that that should be in all of our spaces. I interrupt spaces every time that I speak about teas that, teas that move trauma out of the body. So I'm an herbal student right now. Did you guys know there are teas that move trauma out of the body? Teas that move trauma. Tea. 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 Hi, tea. Herbs. <laughs> OK, yeah. Look, af afterwards, come, come holler at me afterwards. <laughs> I interrupt spaces all the time as a facilitator when I hold tension and agitate organizations around the real barriers in our social justice work. That it ain't got nothing to do with us strategizing more. It ain't got nothing to do with having more bodies in the room. It has everything to do with the person who's here having their own self-care prioritized. I'm pursuing the world as I'd like it to be every time I dare to be messy and have the audacity to make someone uncomfortable by screaming mm -hmm. or sharing my struggles with depression as a platform to, de to denormalize our, lo our laudable high stress environments. My heart's vision is to open a wellness and retreat center, mm -hmm. a place where you come just because you are a place where you dare to be fully present, first and foremost, with yourself. A place where if increased worker productivity results from that, it's great, but it's not the priority. In the interim, my house is my first retreat center. Mm -hmm. So I teach plant-based cooking classes there, talking about herbs there, hosting people there. Every speaking opportunity, every training space, every facilitation space is a wellness plan for me, where I share the simple prescription of storytelling as a powerful healing modality and the catalyst for building strong movements. So I just want to leave you with this quote again. I love myself, the quietest, simplest, most powerful revolution ever. So thank you for space, for allowing me to heal today through the sharing of my stories. I hope you do the same. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow, 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 wow. There is not much that needs to be to be said <laughs> following that. Um, we will just keep on keeping on. And next we have Dr. Asia Upchurch, who I, I just must add, um, I, uh, has transformed my time here at Harvard as a pioneer in teaching a class at the ed school called Can't Stop, Own Stop, Understanding Hip Hop, Pedagogy. Maybe I got that little mixed up. All right. but it's a <laughs> um, and so it's an honor and a privilege to, um, to have her share and speak a little bit about the dope work that she does. Call it Paul Bubba Sparks. Get it right, 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 get it right
<laughs> now that I have your attention, we can begin. This is not a piece for your entertainment. In fact, this is not a piece at all. This is the documentation of my progress in this work of being, of being black, of being girl, of being woman, of having dark skin, butt, hips, booty, thighs, curves, muscles, hell, cellulite. <laughs> this is the work of trying to stand, to rise, to fall, to recover, to hide, to smile. This is an artifact in the documentation of this progress in the work of being. And so, you are all welcome. You always find a way for yourselves to be so. Thus, you are all welcome to take in this artifact, this me, here, now, in progress, working hard on all fronts to heal myself and by extension or necessity, you. So, like I said, you are all welcome. I mean, you were going to watch anyway, right? <laughs> you came here to watch, to consume. I know you did. Well, sorry, not sorry. I am not here for your consumption. We are not here for your consumption. No, no, no. I am not an aesthetic or product for play, for purchase, for your convenience. I am not here for your tokenism or your street cred. I am not a buffet for you to pick at what you want and then discard the rest of me. In third grade, and this is a true story, I had stellar pirouettes. So much so, my ballet teacher would come get me out of class to demonstrate to the eighth graders. Yet he also demonstrated that I had these big old muscular legs. You see, he picked my talent and discarded my body. They picked Sarah Bartman's body for display, for lust, for wondering, for fantasy, for ridicule, and for sport. And they discarded her humanity. Dear Aunt Sarah... I humbly beg your forgiveness for falling into the lure of the attention of their gaze. Mm. Our little girls try to reach for us and bear us, but we feel unbearable. We feel empowered and empty. Mm. They are eating us, and somehow our hands have gotten on the serving where we are their food. Yet we long to taste our own sweetness without being devoured by them. It is a complicated dance with lots of missteps, but be certain that we are not here for your consumption. Can I have some lights, please? So let me ask y'all a question. How old were you your first time? You? You heard me. How old were you your first time? How old were you the first time you were consumed by their gaze? Mm. Me. I was 19. And solely for being black, for being girl, woman, having chocolate skin, butt, booty, hips, thighs, curves, muscles, for being foreign, I got to be prostitute in their eyes. In Las Calles de Buenos Aires, there was a foul air that invited me, us, to the most dehumanizing of gazes. And so began my work of standing, falling, trying to forget what they think of me, of smiling, crying, and of knocking a mother out who tries to put their hands on my queendom unsolicited. So began this arduous work of trying to be being. So I'll repeat, I am not here for your consumption. We are not here for your consumption. If I were, I would conjure up my black girl magic and turn my sweetness, my care, my fire into the most vile venom. 
your favorite flavor of the most irresistible appropriation. I would cast my often hated but frequently imitated beauty into the personification of Medusa. Would that fix your gaze, your greed? This is not a performance for your entertainment. This is not a show. No, this is an invitation. It's a dare and it's a warning. Do not be amused. Do not be inspired. And please, do not be sorry. At least don't tell me that you are. I no longer have the interest or capacity to hear your words and see your fragile laden actions and believe those to be congruent with or helpful to my needs. I actually wish you a divine discomfort. I wish that you become so diseased that you do something differently, do something better. This has been an invitation to be more than entertained, to welcome discomfort, and to be your own work in progress so that my progress in being can continue without so much damn work. Can I get some music, please? Thank you. So I'll just say very quickly that um, I do conduct myself as someone who sees and interacts with the world um, as a mover, as a dancer, and I stay very much more so um, an acknowledgement that we all have bodies. And I think, um, quite honestly, as a black woman, just to uh, link into what my other sisters have spoken about, that we have not been in the space to narrate and to own the narratives about our bodies as an aesthetic thing, as a corporeal thing, as a metaphorical thing, as an actual thing. And I think for me, if we are to be at the center, black women of any progressive change, then we do need to reconnect with our bodies, not as a commercial product, not as a source for commentary by everyone else, but as the authors of our own stories to own our trauma and our joy, to know where it lives and what addresses in our bodies it occupies, um, so that if we often are any way, in spite and despite of our own power and, and, and will, placed in this position to be uh, the, both the inspiration for everything culturally dope, or also robbed of our creative um, authorship, then we might as well make sure, since they're gonna siphon from what we do, that we be in control of our free, liberated selves. So then if there is gonna be catalyst, if we are gonna be catalyst incidentally, then maybe catalyst, catalyzing everybody to reconnect to their bodies because we are all have all been traumatized by the, the greatest uh, operation that ever has existed, which is colonization. And as intentional it has, as it has been, it has also suppressed how we live in our bodies and conduct ourselves. And so as an educator, as an artist, as a human, as a sister, as a daughter, as an auntie, I'm out here in these streets, in these halls of academia, believing that dancing it out is not just for expression, but it is also um, very necessary for individual and collective healing. Um, uh, I am, <laughs> I'm feeling it in my body. I'm feeling the move and hey. the groove, and I just want to honor and lift up and discuss some of the things, that the, 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 the themes, but also the particularity that each of you are talking about when, when, you, when you talk about how you have learned to cultivate yourself first your 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 personhood your human your humanity your dignity that has been attempted time and again to be 
robbed, silenced, um, minimalized. Mm -hmm. um, and how at the center of that, each of you have talked about um, the importance of connecting with our youth, the younger generation, mm -hmm. creating um, you know, data for black lives so that youth who are affected by by these technologies that aren't are indirectly or directly and don't aren't aware of it can begin to have access to information um whether it's through their parents or through other um, spheres of influence that then can help them to redirect or better use mm -hmm. these machines that we're inundated with mm -hmm. um and um you know uh Sakuria, you you speaking naming you know doing work as a director of programs with youth to to center leadership and what that looks like in communal praxis, but also what it means to begin to honor the poetry, the simplicity of I am, I am a revolution. I am who I am, and I need not be anything more or or or, or less. Um, I think Professor H, uh, Professor Upchurch, about um, something you talked about and assigned in class, KRS One. He states, you know, hip hop is not, um, you know, it, it, it's not just the arts. It's not just the arts. Thank you. There is a consciousness to it. Mm -hmm. There is a, an active consciousness to it, and and that what so many people, what it has been commodified to become. We forget that it's rooted in peace, love, unity, and having fun. Mm -hmm. That that's where it came from. Mm -hmm. um, and so I want to center some of those principles and what you all were speaking about, and 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 give you a uh, perhaps a chance to. Um, uh, elaborate um, a little bit more on um, some, something that you brought up, Sikuria, discharge, mm -hmm. the discharge. And I feel like what we just saw, Professor a um, Upchurch, was your beautiful discharge and reclamation and statement and invitation, as you said, mm -hmm. um, and how you centered that, yes, she so, so well in the beginning with naming why you began to embark on this journey of entrepreneurship. So if you want to offer up, because I know it's being recorded, and there are going to be some young people watching. <laughs> um, can you elaborate a little bit on the, the, that power of discharge and maybe what you would um, tell your younger daughter or sister or mm -hmm. um, student from these, these here walls at Harvard? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I'm sure I will. A mentor of mine in this work um, said to me very early on when I first started organizing, um, Sakuria, you teach people how to treat you. And I think that's the most um, powerful lesson that I take with me um, each and every day and that every opportunity is, every moment is an opportunity to make different decisions about how I want to be treated. I get to renegotiate things um, if ever I agree to something that I no longer um, am now in agreement with. And I think organizing um, and social justice movements especially is just this beautiful display of people renegotiating things all the time. Um, and so I, so I think especially as it relates to um, just leaning into what it means for us to be fully authentic with ourselves and in tune with our own bodies, in tune with our own needs, in tune with maybe this um, healing practice um, was powerful for me last week um, and maybe it isn't for me anymore. Um, I think that has everything to do with a person's ability to be whole and able to do this work well. Um, I think one, I, I, I like people. I like them all, mostly. Um, I love <laughs> I love working with young people um, because they teach me the new dances um, <laughs> that make me feel very old. Um, but like the, I joke in that, and like, but I think a lot of times as we move through this invisible draft of becoming an adult and then being very serious and somehow now like all oh, these, this young generation is out of control, it's just unsalvageable. Um, I like working with young people because I feel like in the midst of it, I, I am around folks who still are hopeful and optimistic and um, haven't been completely uh, drafted into becoming curmudgeonly um, and just like, woe is me. Um, so I think it's important to 
be a, a supporter. I try to figure out how to be a cheerleader with and for young people and, and keep learning from other folks who are doing super dope youth development based work where the adult in the room is not meant to just tell you what to do, tell you what to do, just sit down. I mean, I grew up in, I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, grew up um, in some, you know, conservative Midwestern leanings, old school leanings. I love my family my, and I'm not faulting them, but a lot of um, be seen and not heard. Um, and the pedagogy of that is very long lasting. Um, and I, I try to not be that person with young people because I don't want to quell their imagination. Imagination isn't, isn't, doesn't have a price tag on it, I don't think. I think we all have it. Um, and so I think working with young people, I feel like my role is to make sure they're still in touch with it. If the, if the fire has gone out, then how can I be something that helps fan it um, back aflame? And I think the arts are positioned in a way to help with that, mm -hmm. particularly. Um, and so I think like when I, I have a lot of nieces and nephews and I think about my nieces a lot. I'm particularly drawn to young black girls because not that that's a monolithic experience, but I know a lot about being a young black girl. And I know a lot is around the things that we are told outright and the things that we just kind of imbibe and learn quietly about how to be some of that empowering and some of that very disempowering. So I have a heart to stay around young black girls because if I could save not that I have a savior's cape on, but if I could spare, I should say, anyone from learning some lessons the hard way that I did, mm -hmm. then I feel like that's my obligation to treat every young girl like my little sister um, and help keep their imaginative flames alive. Um, because certainly my pathway to go from the neighborhood I'm from in Northside St. Louis to be a Harvard professor, there wasn't necessarily a, a, a roadmap that anybody kind of like revealed for that. And I'm uh, being an artist, I've kind of created my own pathway anyway, but I think I don't want to exceptionalize myself. I think the ability to dream and to imagine and to do is out there. So I'm supposed to be around young people to help amp that up. I'm like hype person 3000 for them. So um, I, 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 I like nothing more frightens me than a young person who is not imaginative anymore. That I feel like that is a fail that is on all of us and we shouldn't applaud ourselves when young people strive in spite of our um, apathy to support them. And so that's the, that's the call behind this for me. Great, wonderful. You know, I like thinking about wholeness and, and, and thinking about this generational conversation as well. For me, you know, I had actually one of my mentors who went to Harvard Divinity School, the chaplain at Brown, Reverend Terry C. Say, she, um, she would have spiritual directions and at Brown, and this was a space that she created for us. And, you know, one of the things that we would always talk about was not who we wanted to, not what we wanted to be, but who we wanted to become. And even as like an undergraduate, I thought about that all the time because, you know, as, as, as everybody was saying earlier, there's so much pressure to do this and to become this. And I think, you know, for me, you know, even just this whole process of starting off as a youth organizer and coming and starting Data for Black Lives, like in the process, I saw a lot of black women sacrifice themselves, right? I saw people literally you know, become martyrs for the movement. I saw people put themselves second and then this nonprofit industrial complex system spit, chews you up, spits you out. And what, what do you have left? You, you don't have a community, you don't have anything because, you know, you're, you're, you're dispensable according to this capitalist logic. And, you know, that's why the story, the story I love to tell with Data for Black Lives is that, you know, I, in order for me to step into this work and to really do it was, it, it took me really, stepping into myself and saying, even after our first conference, I saw, wow, this idea is really powerful. There's people's lives who are impacted by this. This is like a huge responsibility. What I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna move to Arizona for a year and a half, be in the desert, be completely in quiet, spend time off the internet, be, you know, take up weightlifting movement and just be in a place where I can pray, meditate. The opposite of what people wanted me to do, right? Oh, Data for Black Lives is so much hype. This is great. Stay in New York City. No, I felt like I was being pulled in all these different directions. But I knew that in order for me to show up in the way that I needed to show up as a leader, I had to do this for myself. And I think that was the best decision that I could, could, could have ever made, right? All this other great accolades, four, 30, under 30, raising all this money, great sold out conferences. That, w that was 
only because I took the time to say, I'm going to put myself first. I'm going to heal. I'm going to address these, you know, kind of things that I have internalized about what it means to be black, what it means to be a woman, what it what it looks like to be a leader when a leader is kind of a, you know, homogenous, like we have an image of what a leader is, male, white, not black woman, and how we show up in these spaces. So I think that's what I tell young people. That's what, you know, a lot of black women who, you know, whose shoulders I stand on told me by experience or explicitly, right? Like, how do we show up differently? How do we assert life starting with ourselves again in a system that demands destruction, death, um, and treat us as if we're disposable? So that's always what I say is one of the main reasons why we've been so successful. And that's what I really lead with our movement, right? How do we put people first? How do we create a space of love, healing, and belonging, right? That has a lot to do with data. You know, that's more important than data. Um, because imagine if all these technological systems were actually infused with that versus destruction, right? We wouldn't be in the situation we are in now. So. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, we're going to open it up for questions. I got my one question out. So we uh, have uh, folks who are going to come around. And if you have um, any questions for any of the panel panelists, please just raise your hand. And we are going to have an open dialogue dance. There's one over here. Hello, um, all of you all are very good. I'm glad I'm here. Aisha, this is directed to you. Um, I have a granddaughter who's at Boston Conservatory, Berkeley. Um, <clears throat> she's hippie. She has always been a ballerina. There's teachers that are there. There's only a few that are our color who have really discovered you for getting back for her not getting back on her toes. Mm -hmm. You know, and I mean, this was her passion and they have wiped it out and this is her last semester at Boston Conservatory Berkeley. I mean, here have you taken a child who, who's done something her whole life and all of a sudden it just stopped. Mm -hmm. How would you address something like this? Um, thank you for offering that. Um, you know, I, I grew up, and I still do, I love ballet, um, but I also grew up naturally just in my community and in my family with West African dancing and drumming and jazz. So I often realize, like, I, I don't think there was an option for me to get too, too, too messed up by some things that some problematic dance teachers said, um, who should never been allowed to be teachers. Um, you can't let artists get away with everything just because it's cool. If you can be a bad teacher, Period. Um, so what I would offer is for, um, for, for her, for you all as a family, to um, look at the other places that are here in Boston where she will not feel um, marginalized and not be treated as spectacle um, either outrightly or um, less directly because of, of the body that she's in. I think there are some studios that are here, but I also think like there are companies, I mean, I didn't, it wasn't until I was in my early 20s when I saw Urban Bush women perform and it changed my life. That was the first time I saw brown women with kinky hair, booty hips, boobs, the whole nine, moving beautifully in different shades of brown. Um, and so, I think exposure beyond that that context. You got to call a context out. Like, for all the beautiful things that can be instructed there, I think um, there's more that needs to be supplemented to her experience so that it that doesn't become so overwhelming. And just to make sure you love on her and and, and push her. Well, a couple of weeks ago, she was on a Catholic board. She danced for Lizzo because she was looking for girls like her. Well, see, that's the other thing. Well, then you can really then. Here's the thing also, it's all about currency, right? That's how I say it. I'm here at Harvard. Harvard is a type of currency. There are so how many currencies exist in the world? Right, that many, right? And so this is just one other form of currency. It does not supplant the other ways and means of capital that we have as people. It's about when do you pull a certain piece of piece of coin out of your um, wallet. I'm saying I'm using a metaphor, right? And so like I don't let the currency of Harvard displace the currency of Northside St. Louis. Yeah ever. 
I hold them dear for different reasons, but I don't erase everything. So if she, everybody can't dance for Lizzo. <laughs> what? <laughs> Hashtag jealous right here. What are we doing? What are we talking about? <laughs> Berkeley, whatever. <laughs> so hey, Berkeley should be so lucky. I mean, they're welcome. <laughs> so let a pivot bow and walk it out. <laughs> And she goes to Halloween dancing. Oh, <laughs> she the whole truth. Uh -huh. I'm a fan. Oh yeah. Go ahead. We got a question up here. Microphone's coming. Thank you so much for such an incredible panel. This is like. We all needed this. I needed this, so thank you. And sometimes my <laughs> my hand will go up before something is fully like figured out, but that's also just right. my spirit being like, eh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm still working it out, but so much resonated with me. Um, and specifically, I'm thinking about all of the black women and femmes in this room who do so much and carry so many different things while being a student. We're not simply students, we're organizers, we're putting together conferences that are consistently severely underfunded, under-resourced, mm -hmm. under-supported, because our lives are not seen as central and as important and as valid, and our scholarship isn't seen as valid and as central, and we continuously outperform mm -hmm. everyone else. Well, not every, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so something that I'm struggling with is, is how do I not leave this institution feeling like burnt out and angry um, and, and bitter? Because I, I feel bitter every day. Um, but I also know that the work we're doing is so important. And I don't know, I'm, I'm struggling through this right now, but you know, specifically around burnout and, and being in a space that doesn't want you, but knowing that you're doing work that's so critical and necessary. Um, and yeah, that, and I'm, I'm worried because I'm graduating in three months and I feel like I'm gonna like crawl across the stage to get this diploma wow. and I don't want to. <laughs> Every day. Oh, she said, get that tea. Oh, she need that tea. Yeah, see me, see me after for the tea. I will. Saul Bona. Saul Bona. That Swahili term means I see you. The response is, Nikona, I am seeing. I think it is critical that black and brown women place ourselves in places where we feel seen. And I think if your experience here right now is one of not being seen, I think it's important that you're leaning into spaces where you're very, very clear that people see you to counter that narrative, to create that contradiction so that you're clear, like in heart, mind, spirit, of what it is. And I think too, what my experience for myself is, um, very similar experiences in, in school, I think having to be um, still enough to ask myself, um, what potentially has this experience prepared me for? And I'm so clear that there's no wasted experience that I've had everything I'm using to teach off of, everything I'm using um, as an opportunity to, to continue to grow myself. And so I think just for you being mindful that um, even now with all these experiences, I imagine the future you will see all the ways in which they get recycled um, into these beautiful stories of times when you endured, times when you thrived, times when you were pushed um, to be the highest version of yourself. Joy, J-O-Y, the church say amen, <laughs> was the word that came to me last year for other reasons. But I just, I think for everyone in any institution, this one or wherever, 
that joy does not come from people. I personally don't believe it's the same thing as happiness. Um, but like the your joy is never on the bartering table. And that this place, remember that you don't have to, I don't feel like we should allow, we should accidentally place institutions in a in a position where we start negotiating our joy. Like I get out of Harvard what I need to get out of Harvard, and Harvard's blessed by me. Um, but I don't, I don't transact on my joy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that I think again, like leaning into the spaces where you, that is never a question, mm -hmm. and remembering that you are here with a mission to get what you need out of it, and it may never ever hug you like a teddy bear. Mm -hmm. That's not what it was intended for either. Mm -hmm. um, and so, like, I don't expect the screwdriver to do what a ballpoint pen can mm -hmm. and so like just up and I and, and so like just remembering that this is a tool that you get to use and that your joy is never the currency that you trade in for this experience mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes I'm still on the don't expect the screwdriver to do what a ballpoint <laughs> pen can um, <laughs> I think we had a question here. I didn't really have a question. Okay. So um, I came here uh, with my partner um, to oh, support. We'll give you the microphone because so oh, okay. it's being recorded. Mm -hmm. I want to say alafia to you, mm -hmm. uh, which means peace in the Yoruba tradition. I'm a priestess of Yoruba, uh, Shango to be specific, for 30 years. And I just, and I'm my 80th birthday is coming up. Um, Sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> it's coming up next weekend. Wow. <laughs> so for me, it's a rite of passage. And we came here to support my partner's um, second cousin, um, who is going to be delivering at 5, uh, at 5 p.m. So wow. we're talking about Vanessa mm. Lindley. So, Everything that I've done in my life up to this point has brought me here mm -hmm. because it, you are an incredible uh, group of young women. Mm -hmm. Okay, I love this intergenerationality. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just uh, I learn from it. And, mm -hmm. and of course, uh, you have the opportunity to question us, to uh, interview us, to do all the learning together. But what I want to say is that I put together um, conferences in New York City. I'm the founder of the LGBT Kwanzaa um, organization that has been together for 43 years. I'm sitting here figuring out how I'm going to get you, you amazing young women, to New York City and let us do all that you do the wellness, the healing, the movement, mm -hmm. uh, social media data. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I want to talk about that when we finish. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we, how are we on time? All right, beautiful. Okay, we're going to wrap it up. We're wrap it up. We're going to wrap it up. We go, oh, <laughs> Take a look around you. What do you see? Everything they said you wouldn't, couldn't, shouldn't be. We break boxes to be free while, while, while cynics scoff and deceive. They said you wouldn't achieve, but you wouldn't believe all the pain they put you through. Throwing shame in your name, but can't change what God already ordained in you. So, darling, keep your head up. Never let them see you sweat, because dark can't drive out darkness and hate can't drive out hate and in this space he can spark his love that can liberate grace to permeate shout out to MLK yes yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
here. So we just want to thank you sincerely for your ear, for your presence, for your time, for hearing and being open to moving and grooving and shaking things up a little bit. Um, and so we're going to transition. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get off the mic and we should get a group photo together with everyone at some point. That's what I'm sure they're going to do already. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to our amazing panelists and our moderator.